us humans have this innate desire to understand things. We ask ourselves how and why things occur the way they occur around us. Scientific studies are a modern way to answer the how and the why. The first part of my talk today isn't going to be on how to conduct these studies or how to publish scientific articles, but rather how these studies are interpreted in our everyday life. Me and most probably you guys don't really thoroughly read scientific studies anymore. Even scientists don't read studies anymore because the information is disseminated to us to various sources such as the media on TV or social media, Facebook, and sometimes most of the time, they're not accurately interpreted. Best news ever. Science says a glass of red wine may be equivalent to an hour at the gym. You might think the source is not reliable enough. Fox News says the same thing. I actually went and s to find out where this statement comes from. A great study talking about resveratrol, which is a natural phenol occurring in grapes. And this phenol is, has wonderful antioxidant properties. It's great for muscle function, even cardiac function. Nowhere in the study they mention wine or the gym. Alcohol and coffee help you live past 90, a study say. A perfect example, just because you find a correlation, you can't make a statement like that. It's true, alcohol helps you speak a foreign language better. We might have experiences with this one when your uh, Spanish undergrad 101 comes into play after a few beers. Scientific study says octopuses may have come from outer space. Super interesting study. It talks about the octopus that is capable of surviving in circumstances similar to that of outer space. That doesn't mean they come from there. <laughs> but it is more catchy to say it this way than to actually interpret it accurately. And this is the problem, because we read headlines, we read titles, we read abstracts, we don't entirely read studies, and we take these statements and we like them and we share them and they exponentially grow. Cannabis lowers men's sperm count, says Science Insider. Cannabis leads to higher sperm count, says Science Insider. The parachute trial is, uh, is a great study. It's a randomized control trial. So for, for those of you who don't know, randomized control trial is the highest form of scientific evidence. You have an intervention group, experimental group. You have a control group. Experimental group, parachute used to prevent death and major trauma when jumping off an aircraft. So you would assume intervention group, have parachutes, control group, don't have parachutes. <laughs> In fact, this study was done on purpose. The authors of these studies did it purposefully to say that a cursory reading of the title and the abstract is not sufficient to make conclusions. And in the methods section of this study, they mentioned that the aircraft always remained grounded. It never took off. <laughs> Your daily coffee intake is making you deaf, says science. This is super interesting to me because I study hearing. I've dedicated seven years of my life just to studying hearing and researching. And this was everywhere. Caffeine contributes to hearing loss. Your morning coffee is making you deaf. Caffeine may play a role in hearing loss, says McGill's study. But wait a minute, that's my study. I, I published this in 2018 at JAMA Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, and my study doesn't say that your morning cup of coffee is making you deaf. The study was about how auditory hair cell functions recover after loud noises in large amount of doses of caffeine. And interestingly, this study was done in guinea pigs. Never has the translation been made to humans. The amount of caffeine we gave to guinea pigs is actually the equivalent of 32 cups of coffee a day. So to continue on hearing, the next part of my talk, I want to talk to you guys about the human body's innate ability to hear through bones. So to give you an example, I want to start by a question first. Have you guys ever heard your own voice in a recording? You sound weird. You're always off. Well, to tell you why, I want to tell you about how we hear. So, this exact moment. My voice resonates in this room. The sound of my voice travels and is captured by my ear and as well as your ears, and we hear the sound of my voice through air conduction hearing. 
However, I'm the only one in this room who could hear my own voice through my bones. Because when I speak, my larynx, my vocal cords create vibrations. And these vibrations transfer in my skull bone, in my cheekbone, and I can hear my own voice through the vibrations of my bones. Usually, everyday life, you hear your own voice through two pathways, bone and air. But your voice coming out of a recording only enters your auditory pathway by the air conduction. Bone conduction is lost. And since bone conduction is better at transferring uh, lower frequencies, your voice out of a recording is higher pitched than you perceive it to be. And an interesting fact, your voice out of a recording is how everyone else hears you. <laughs> yeah, you're the only one that hears you like you hear yourself. So one of the first ones that I've discovered, the body's ability to hear through bones, is the great Ludwig van Beethoven. Now, Beethoven became deaf at the age of 26, as you may know. And to compose his greatest works, he did this. By simply resting his head on the piano, he allowed sound vibrations to transfer through his bones and hear. At that time, people assumed that Beethoven had a special connection with the instrument. He was a superhero, great composer. But he used bone conduction hearing to hear and compose his work. Now, many, many emerging technologies, such as the military, have started adapting bone conduction hearing in their technologies. So helmets in the military have bone conduction speakers in them. Because as you can imagine, you're in the war zone, you need to hear if anything happens around you, but you also need to communicate with the base with your fellow soldiers. Bone conduction headphones are becoming increasingly popular. You're on your bike or you're running on the street. You want that podcast or you want the music in your head, but you also need to hear if anything moves around you. Bone conduction speakers integrated in glasses and sunglasses are popular, but like every emerging innovation in society, there are drawbacks. Imagine being in the metro, and if you're lucky enough to have that window seat, you take it and you, you decide to rest your eyes a little on the window. Well, a German train company has figured out a new dimension for advertisements, as they lay targeted messages to commuters who lay their head on the window. This has been super controversial, and there's a liber civil liberty activists are saying that this is a violation of a person's right to rest. Now, one of the greatest innovations using bone conduction hearing, in my opinion, I might be biased, it's the focus of my PhD work. Now, I focus uh, my work on innovating hearing implant surgeries in children. And uh, have you guys seen these videos? It's truly remarkable. Through medicine and technology, we've allowed people who have never heard in their lives to hear. We need to think of our eyes and ears as simply tools that relay information to the brain. You don't hear with your ears and you don't see with your eyes. You hear and you see with your brain. These devices are simply tools such as a keyboard of a computer. It relays information to the brain. Helen Keller, the first deaf and blind person in the world, said that blindness separates us from things, but it's deafness that separates us from people. And through these implants, we've allowed children to connect with the sound of their mother's voices. And this has huge, huge benefits in their development and in their quality of life. Now, what if I told you that my glasses have bone conduction hearing speakers in them? I recorded this talk earlier, and I'm simply repeating what's being said in my head right now. It's not the case. But this is possible. And you can think of many, many risky applications of this technologies. And I'm sure students are thinking exams now, how we can. <laughs> the hardest part about these implants and to make it work optimally is not in the complexity of the surgery. And it's not in the technicality of the devices. The hardest part is in the brain's re-ability to organize itself and form new neural connections. And this is termed as neuroplasticity. Now, when we are born, our brain has predetermined areas to process information. The side of your brain's temporal lobe process auditory information. Back of your brain, occipital lobe, processes visual information. But if during development there is no stimulation reaching these areas of the brain when you're born and you're blind, your occipital lobe isn't being stimulated, well, another sense will quickly come and take over this valuable brain real estate 
That is why blinds can feel better, can, uh, they can hear better, they can sense better. So when these implants were first invented, we assume that we can implant everyone who's never heard and with a simple easy activation on button make them hear again. But that's not the case because 50% of the people that were implanted initially do not wear these implants anymore. Because the brain areas that are supposed to process this new information that's coming after an implant is not being used. So th there is no place for this information to be processed in the brain. And this becomes extremely effortful for the patient and they decide not to use it. That is why neuroplasticity is crucial to implant as early as possible. That is why we have early detection of hearing loss right now. And you can probably imagine learning a new language. It's so hard as an adult, unless you have many beers as that study mentioned. But as a child, children can learn three to four languages at once. Now, my final slide would be a simple reminder that, you know, I was never passionate about hearing. No one in my family is, is deaf. So my advice to, especially the students in this room, is to remain, remain curious. Always read, but be skeptical. Go and validate information you read. Push the envelope. Seek, and you will find answers to the how and to the why. Because passion is not innate. It is developed. It's developed through life experiences. Because life experiences wire and rewire and rewire the brain. Thank you. <laughs>